welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Craft of Teaching Seminar. The Craft of Teaching Seminar is the flagship series of the Craft of Teaching in the Academic Study of Religion. For our guests, is our relatively new in-house program of pedagogical development for our graduate students. This is our second full year. Uh, we will have at the end of the at the end of this year, we will have had 26 different pedagogy-related events, seminars, uh, workshops, and this is the. <laughs> and this is a, in the midst of this very busy schedule of craft and teaching events, this is the, the anchor, the, the quarterly craft and teaching seminar, which the dean invites a distinguished alum to talk about his or her teaching in relationship to their institutional context and in a course that they have recently taught. Before I turn it over to the dean to introduce our guest, I do have a couple of announcements. Of course, if you're a student, don't forget to sign in at the computer at the back of the room to receive craft and teaching credit for attending. And also, I just wanted to very briefly highlight three upcoming events. We have six more events this quarter. Three of those require advanced registration in our PAC, and that's the, uh, the day-long, the first of which is the day-long workshop on dissertation writing and new faculty success with Dr. Peg Boyle Single, um, and that's May 9th. The second is the Divinity School's Assignment Design Workshop. This will be a small, intimate workshop, hands-on workshop where you craft and, and, uh, and develop your own assignment in relationship to a course that you have taught or are teaching or would like to teach. Um, and that will be Saturday or Thursday, May 15th. And then on Saturday, May 31st, is the One Day Reacting to the Past Conference. Reacting is a, an innovative pedagogy that came out of Barnard College and is now at over 300 universities and colleges across the country. And it basically involves um, elaborate role-playing simulations or games, if you like, to teach uh, classic texts and the history of ideas. So you would literally turn your classroom for six to eight weeks uh, into India on the eve of independence or the Council of Nicaea or a whole bunch of scenarios. So, uh, this is a, a restricted workshop, so we can have to limit it to about 20 or 25 participants. So, do um, RSVP um, ASAP to any of those uh, three events I just listed if you'd like to participate in those. Um, and as always, check our web schedule for, uh, for the full uh, offering. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I've been looking forward to this day for a year, and what a real honor and pleasure it is to welcome our distinguished alumnus, Debbie Canasco, back to the Divinity School, back to your title at Baptist School Hall. Um, I uh, am not at this particular session going to give a full academic introduction because I will do that at the lecture this afternoon at 4 30, and we only have a limited amount of time here today to go to about 1.30. And uh, listening to publications, we use up half that time, and I don't want to do that. Uh, but I do want you all to know and remember that the lecture this afternoon is entitled From Axis Mundi to Mapa Mundi, Great Temples and Sacred Bundles in Aztec Society. And that will be at 4.30 this afternoon in the third floor lecture hall with a reception to follow um, in Professor Carrasco's honor uh, here in, 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 in the common room. Um, and may I also, at this time, uh, I want to recognize and welcome back to the call also the members of the Divinity School Alumni Council who are here and who uh, began bright and early this morning. Um, I'm going to read your names because you're still chewing, um, but I would ask you to wave or stand or something just so people know who you are. Um, Benjamin Duholm is uh, MDiv from uh, the year uh, 2007, is Interim Associate Minister at Messiah Lutheran Church in Wakanda, Illinois, and uh, Professor William George, Professor of Theology at Divinity University, holds a PhD from uh, 1990 in the field of ethics and society. John Holt uh, is uh, William R. Keenan, Jr., Professor of the Humanities at Bowdoin College, holds the PhD in History of Religions from 1977. Um, Sharda Jha, 
Ferrari's woman. Here you are. Uh, is um, uh, MDiv and uh, in 2005 and Masters in Public Policy 2005. Um, is director of the Oakland Peace Center and director of interfaith programs in the East Bay Housing, housing Organizations um, in Oakland, California. Ralph Keane is professor of history and Arthur J. Schmidt Foundation Chair in Catholic Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He holds the PhD uh, from in 1990 in the area of history of Christianity in the Divinity School. Laura Lieber, over here, holds the PhD from 2003 in the history of Judaism. She is Associate Professor of Religion at Duke University. And Claire Rothschild, also over there, holds the PhD in uh, 2003 in the area of Bible, New Testament, and Christian literature. Um, is Associate Professor of Theology at Lewis University. And Gary Sparks holds the MDiv from 2004 and the PhD in 2011 in Theology. Right? Uh, who, uh, Gary is assistant professor in humanities and global Christian studies at the University of Louisville. Uh, thank you to the alumni council members for journeying here, some close, some far, to be with us uh, today. Um, so without much further ado, um, the uh, Divinity School of Alumnus of the Year 2014, Professor David Carrasco, um, we are really eager to hear from you about the Catholic Church.
Uh, my dad's parents uh, spoke just English. My grandparents were Mennonite and so spoke the whole German. My name is Elsa Marty, and my grandparents, I'm a first year PhD student in theology, and my grandparents also spoke English. Bring in mind that uh, I do really Christian literature, and all my grandparents spoke English. Barbara Mitchell, uh, New Testament and early Christian literature. All four of my grandparents, um, uh, well, my, my grandmother's name was Martin Mary too. I'm the third Martin Mary. Um, and they all spoke English, and I was raised and told, you are 100% Irish. <laughs> um, and it was only when I came here as a student, and I was a student of Hans Dieter Betts, when he asked me that question, and I said, I, I'm 100% Irish, he said, how do you know? <laughs> so let's hear from over here. Uh, Gary Sparks, I work on Highland Mayan and Division in Latin America, and all my grandparents. Uh, Shala Ja, uh, my father's parents spoke Bengali, which is similar to Hindi. Uh, my mother's parents, because Gail had been stamped out the loans of Scotland by English. Um, my mother's parents grew up in German speaking households. My father's parents. My name is Mary Emily. I'm a PhD student in philosophy and all my grandparents spoke German in the home. Mom still does. Uh, sorry, I'm Clara Rothschild, and my father's grandparents spoke German, and my mother is 100% Irish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laura Lieber, I play Judaism and late antiquity, and three of my grandparents spoke Yiddish growing up, and the other one spoke no Yiddish whatsoever, but fluent New York. <laughs> I have one correction. I, my other grandfather learned how to swear in Swedish because he supervised Swedish workers on the department. <laughs> my grandparents on my mother's side spoke, spoke English. My father's side spoke several kinds of Spanish, a border Spanish, but would kind of, you would also call a high Spanish, a Mexican Spanish, um, and, um, and then a kind of what's called caló which is a, a mixture of Spanish and English. And he knew all of those kind of uh, variations very well. But I, I want to thank you for this because I think it, it, uh, uh, it not only gets me to know you a little bit and hear about you and your lineages, but it also sets the stage for what I wanted to present to you today uh, in this craft of teaching seminar. Now, in preparation for this, I did watch some of the other craft of teaching seminars that have gone on, including Jonathan Smith's. Um, uh, last year, and also several others. Um, it's been a busy semester. If I'd had a little bit more time, I'd been able to put a little bit more time into this, I might have focused this craft of teaching uh, down to something uh, like the midterm exam or the final exam. Uh, how do you do that? And I brought examples of those here for you. I'm going to pass around for those of you interested uh, in, in that kind of a question. Um, I think what I want to say as a as an alum, is that um, um, is, is a background for this course, and I'm going to talk about Moctezuma's Mexico, then and now, which I'm going to sh show you some images from it as a PowerPoint, um, is that in my experience, the courses that you teach once you graduate from here and you go out for the job it depends more than you think on the university and the department you join, because uh, they may hire you for one thing when they advertise and you go and you get interviewed, but when they come and say, well, look, we want you to teach this, uh, it could be very much on the periphery of what it is you're actually trained to do. Um, um, and in, in my case, that's happened at each of the universities I've been at. I started at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I moved to Princeton for 10 years, and now I've been at Harvard for 12 years. And in each case, um, the, the, course that I, the courses that I teach that had the biggest impact uh, for the most part have been, until I got to Harvard, on the periphery of my actual training as a historian of religions working in Mesoamerica. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, the first job I, I ever had was, uh, besides, I used to teach down here at Malcolm X University, actually, when I was, a, when I was studying here. Um, but the first job beyond that was at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I remember uh, that when they, uh, when they interviewed me, they said, hey, you know, can you teach a course on, on American Indian religions? Uh, and in the interview, I said, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, I can teach that course. Abs yeah. He said, well, look, we want you to outline this course for us as part of your thing. Um, well, I'd never taken a course in American Indian religions. I'd never taken a course in American Indians, per se. But... Um, I had had enough good training here at this school uh, that I could put together uh, from different sort of methodological orientations and cultural areas a pretty good course. So I started thinking about that, and I said, well, man, what, what, do, I, what do I know something about? Well, I know something about sacred space and sacred place, because I'd studied here not only with Iliade and Jonathan Smith, but also Paul Wheatley, who at that time was the chairman of the Committee on Social Thought and had written this, this magnificent series of books on, on, the, on the origins of cities and the role of ceremonial centers. So I said, well, my class is gonna begin with sacred place and sacred space. And then I said, well, where among American Indians do I know something about sacred place and sacred space? Well, I said, well, I, I know a lot about Aztec cities. So that's gonna become my sacred place and my sacred space. And that's gonna blow some students' minds because they don't think about Aztec cities and Indians building cities, complex civilizational structures. Um, and so I said, that's, that's how I'm going to start this course. I said, what's the second thing I know something about? Well, I know something about sacred specialists. I know something about shamans. I know something about priesthoods. Um, and, um, you know, in South America, there's some pretty good literature uh, about the whole shamanic priestly tradition, especially in the Amazon. So the second part's going to blow their minds, too, because when they come to class and they think about American Indians, they think it's all going to be the plains. They think it's all going to be the Pueblos and so forth. So I said, the second part of this course will really take something I know pretty well about. That's the methodology of literature about sacred specialists and shamanism. And I know enough about South American shamanism. Um, and I can certainly catch up on it between my interview in April and my job starting in August. Uh, so I said, that's what I'm going to do in the second part of the class. I said, what's the third thing I know something about? Well, I know something about ritual. I know something about ritual and ritual processes and ceremony. And so here I will satisfy their stereotype. And the third part will really be about the ceremonies and the rites of passage of the Plains Indians, especially because there's this really famous book that everybody was reading then and still now called Black Elk Speaks. Uh, and it really has an awful lot of very interesting complex material in terms of the production of that book uh, having to do with this notion of ceremony. So I said, well, that, that's what I'm going to do. So by the time I got the job, they loved this model. Uh, time I got the job, I went to the University of Colorado, and I ended up having the largest class on campus uh, in, in, um, in, in the religious studies. And so it set me going. And as a matter of fact, what happened, which gave me confidence in the kind of method that I learned here at the Divinity School in the History of Religions, is a number of Native American people, they heard, they said, who's this guy teaching this course about us over here? So they started showing up. Um, and in Boulder, Colorado, they had something called the Native American Rights Fund. Native American Rights Fund, which was a very powerful legal organization defending Native American rights. Uh, and they started coming to the class. And in part because of this kind of, of orientation that I had, really coming out of the Iliadi and Jonathan Smith, Charles Long tradition, the Native Americans, they joined me rather than protesting me. They ended up joining me, uh, sometimes coming into the class as co-teachers, um, the first coming in suspiciously, but pretty soon saying, you know, one of the things this guy does that matters a lot to us is that he is not afraid to use the category of the sacred, uh, you know, which has undergone all kinds of critique. But to we Native Americans in Mexico, in Guatemala, uh, there in the plains, they appreciated somebody who came in and said, you know, there are sacred things in, in our lives, and there's somebody here who respects it, even if he's trying to understand it. So... <clears throat> This was an example of how, man, the needs of the local university forced me to put together something I wouldn't have thought of, uh, you know, when I was going there. Uh, when I went to Princeton, uh, they hired me. <laughs> they said, well, what course, what can you teach? I said, I can teach this course. So I taught this course at Princeton, and I ended up in the first year at Princeton teaching one-tenth of the student body in my course. I had 300 students in this very same course. Now I'd really been able to refine it a lot. Uh, and it ended up having a big article in the New York Times about this course at Princeton uh, that suddenly. So 
out of the kind of necessity um, of trying to get a job, I reached down into my methodological orientation, put together something which I could handle. I could handle that at an introductory level. Um, and um, you know, it, it really worked uh, for me. Now what happens in my case is um, when I'm at Princeton, um, I, I don't teach a single course on Mesoamerican religions and traditions at that university. I include it in a number of courses that I do because first of all, there wasn't much interest there, but the university didn't have any kind of, any kind of empirical basis in its museum or not that very much in its, in its archives to really get into Mesoamerican tradition. I mean, it had, had stuff, but what happened was uh, Harvard came calling and everything changed. And I was able to develop the course that I'm gonna show you now, why? Because at Harvard University, um, uh, there were sort of three groups that were interested in me. First of all, there was anthropology department. Secondly, the divinity school. And thirdly, and this was the key, and it's the key to, in part, the course I'm gonna go over in a minute, was the Peabody Museum. They had a museum at Harvard that's got too much loot. It's got loot, <laughs> it's got loot from every tradition that your grandparents came from, let me tell you. you, you know, uh, whether it's Kentucky hillbilly, Pennsylvania Dutch, whatever it is, North Carolina, they got the loot uh, over there at Harvard. Uh, and that, that's an ethical problem that we're always dealing with. But one of the things that they also had was not only all this loot from Guatemala, from Mexico, from Honduras, uh, it went back, you know, 125 years they've been getting this loot. Uh, and they've had very serious people going into <coughs> Mesoamerica and Latin America doing studies. They had a whole series of serious people. You know, Alfred Tazer was there, Bowditch was there. Uh, a guy named Vodi came there in the 70s, and he started a course on campus that became, in a sense, the seed for the course that I now teach. But at that time, uh, in Harvard's unwisdom, uh, they had a category called foreign cultures. <laughs> it's called foreign cultures. Uh, that was their big thing, see? Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, until about 10 years ago, Harvard didn't think it had a need to send students on, uh, you know, overseas to do any kind of field work, international studies. Uh, they, they didn't have an inter, a really an international studies program for students. Now it's got a big one, uh, and they're, they're touting it. But at that time, it took people like this guy, Evan Vogt, who was a University of Chicago graduate in anthropology um, uh, and had done 25 years of research in the Chiapas, in Chiapas, to start a course where Mesoamerica really became a very significant kind of contribution. So this guy, Evan Vogt, starts this course, and he sneaks into foreign cultures and he starts studying Central America, Mexico, and so forth. And it becomes somewhat popular. It's basically an ethnographic course. Soon, following upon him, comes a very big name, a guy named Gordon Willey. When I was a student here, uh, and uh, I was reading into Mesoamerican history, we always read Gordon Willey. Well, Gordon Willey was an archaeologist, so now the shift went from ethnography to archaeology. Now it's going back to ethnography an awful lot, especially in religious studies at a place like Harvard. So this guy, uh, Willie, he took the course, still in foreign cultures, uh, and he developed it much more in er terms of archeology span with some ethnography because he'd done major excavations um, in uh, Honduras at Copan, uh, in Mexico, and he also was a very broad thinker. So I arrive at Harvard just as his career is ending and the course has now been passed to another generation and um, still called foreign cultures, but the course is called Mesoamerican Civilizations 34. Um, and it has a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, it has a pretty good enrollment. And now it's taught by one of the wunderkinds of uh, Maya studies, a guy named David Stewart. David Stewart was the youngest MacArthur Fellow ever. I think he got the MacArthur Fellow when he was like 17, because he'd participated, he'd participated in the decipherment of the Maya code. And he was at Harvard, not as a full professor or anything like that, because uh, Harvard has problems with those kind of things. But David was there doing very important work uh, really revealing as the decipherment is taking place how the Maya language, how the Maya glyph system is being, uh, how, that, how that code is being cracked. Uh, another guy arrives named William Fash, who now team teaches this course with me, and he's a very serious archeology span also in Central America. But Fash, unlike a lot of other Mayanists, and you'll, you'll talk about this at that time, these Mayanists, because they had broken the code, let me put it like this. They were snobs. And they were snobs about the rest of Mesoamerica. They felt that the Maya world was really the thing to study. 
um, and that uh, the real genius of uh, Mesoamerican cultures that come uh, through the classic Maya traditions. Uh, and they had a case, they had some strong case because the Maya sculpture, and I'm going to show you some of it, in the Maya language and the decipherment of this was a radical breakthrough, it was a wonderful thing. But this guy William Fash was a little bit different because he was also interested in the continuities as well as the changes in the cosmovision and in the archaeological record between central Mexico and the Maya world. So in about 1999, I was asked to become the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Mesoamerican Cultures. And the problem I had was how could I find Mayanists who would work with central Mexicans, uh, scholars, to put together an encyclopedia that would really be integrative. Now the other thing that I ran into, which you'll, which you'll hear more about this afternoon, is um, when I was uh, studying Mesoamerica um, here, and then I went on to the University of Colorado, um, what, I, what bothered me was about North American scholars, especially in relationship to Mesoamerican studies, was that they often built their careers and did some very good scholarship, uh, and they threw a lot of Mexican archaeologists and ethnographers into their footnotes, but they really didn't want to build a kind of partnership in terms of the interpretation of these great developments. This was really a problem in the Maya area too, because the Maya scholars, for the most part, for a long time, were, were non-Honduran, they were non-Mexicans, they were North Americans. And they were very good scholars, but they had sometimes problems in really giving credit to a lot of people in Mexico and other places who'd done fundamental and very important work in this. And one of the decisions I made as a young scholar was that I wasn't going to do that. I was going to build partnerships. Uh, and as you'll hear this afternoon, I was very fortunate as a young scholar to be invited to become one of the few people who helped to, uh, to decipher the excavation of the great Aztec temple in Mexico City. Uh, and partly because the Mexicans there said, we can trust this guy. This guy's not here to make his career in the United States and leave us behind. This guy's here to work with us and so forth. And I think this is one of the reasons what I'm trying to say is one of the reasons that I was brought to Harvard because Harvard did have a tradition and I needed Harvard, but Harvard felt to be frank, they needed me. Because one of the things that I brought with me was this partnership. Here I was a Mexican American trained at the University of Chicago in the divinity school, in the history of religions, working in Mexico with neo-Marxist archaeologists. And these neo-Marxist archaeologists, they were hungry for the Chicago tradition. They wanted to read Eliade and Jonathan Smith and Charles Long. You weren't getting in Mexico the kind of critiques of these people that you got here. You were getting people saying, look, we understand the neo-Marxist material analysis of the rise of these civilizations. We understand the role of agriculture. We believe in the material basis of this culture, but we look at the evidence and all over the place there's religious experience, there's religious orientation, and we are open to the kind of interpretive language that we get out of the Chicago tradition. And it was because of my training right here in this school that I was able, in part, to be invited to become one of the leaders in the interpretation of Mesoamerican cities and symbols. So uh, it was this kind of background that led me to uh, Harvard in the kind of, of work I do now, and including a, a course like this. So what I wanted to do was to just run you through the course a little bit, showing you some of the images and some of the way that, that I've put it together, and going back to this question of your languages in your families. Um, because I grew up as a Mexican-American, um, uh, and because I lived in Mexico as a teenager for a while, um, but also because I was trained at this university in comparative analysis. And when I was trained here at the Divinity School, uh, there were two kind of biases about history of religions, which may seem like old time religion to you. But at the time they were very important and they stood the test of time for me. And one of them was, of course, coming out of the, the work of Joachim Vach, that when you studied religion, you know, your ruler for the study of religion shouldn't be the Judeo-Christian tradition. Not only shouldn't it be the Judeo-Christian tradition as the ruler, as the thing that you use to compare everybody else, either in an overt or covert way, it really ought to be a whole range of traditions that even though they didn't have what was overt philosophical traditions and texts in their symbols, in their rituals, and in their myths, there was very complex coherent systems of metaphysics. But you had to know how to get into those systems of metaphysics by looking at the Aztec calendar stone, by looking at these rituals of people today. Uh, and that really stood the test of time for me. Um, uh, and that this notion of comparison itself would not be lodged fundamentally 
in uh, you know, the home religions, that the notion of comparison and theory could come out of the texts of other people. Uh, and this was a tremendous uh, benefit to me, and it was also something that attracted the Mexican scholars uh, to the work uh, that I did. So uh, in doing a course like this on Mesoamerican cultures, I wanted to also give a sense of continuity and discontinuity between then and now. Uh, and so in the, the course that I uh, teach with William Fash, the archaeologist, um, we started this language, it used to be foreign cultures, 34. Now it's Moctezuma's Mexico, then and now. Uh, and, you know, we start with this notion of comparison uh, from the Japanese scholar, uh, Japanese writer, uh, Kamon no Chome, to understand the world of today, hold it up to the world of long ago. That's a different kind of comparison. Uh, it's a controversial kind of comparison. But you get these 17, 18 year olds showing up at Harvard, uh, and you want to give them this kind of thinking. Um, it's not necessarily that it's true, but it's something to think about, to understand the world of today, hold it up to the world of long ago. And this also means a lot. I don't know how it is for, for you and your students. It also meant an awful lot for the Latinos and the Africans in the classes, especially the Latinos who do tend to follow me at Harvard, um, because uh, many of them grow up uh, feeling a tremendous paradox toward their own ancestral tradition. They've grown up in this country getting one message after another. Mexican, Honduran, Guatemalan stuff is, is not worth it. It doesn't measure up to studying the Greeks or studying the Indians or, uh, from India or studying uh, Rome and stuff like that. Uh, but in fact, uh, maybe uh, there's something very important to study here as well. So one of the things that we're trying to do in this course is to, first of all, start off with the notion that Mesoamerica has this cultural depth, this enormous diversity, uh, and that what really was important to me here at the University of Chicago was when I studied with Paul Wheatley uh, at the, over in the Committee on Social Thought, um, uh, who, who really revealed that Mexico was one of the areas, primary areas of, of primary urban generation. And it was important to study not only because it was Mexican, not only because it was Mesoamerican, not only because it was one of my ancestral traditions, it was important because there was so much you could learn by raising questions about how did the first cities come to be constructed on this earth? Uh, and Mesoamerica was one of the seven areas where cities came to be constructed. That meant that there was an enormous amount of competition, um, uh, cooperation, uh, long distance trading, tremendous cosmologies. And they went on for thousands of years in this area uh, uh, that a lot of people had always uh, put uh, through the lens of these are people who've been conquered. Uh, and therefore, you're looking here at the uh, downtown Mexico City. How many of you have ever been to Mexico City? How many of you have been to Paris? I see. There you go, right there. That's the problem, right there. So, you know, you can drive to Mexico City. Here's the downtown Mexico City. This is the Zocalo. This is the presidential palace over there. Is the church. And the great Aztec temple, where I'm going to take you, was built right there underneath that particular structure. And that's where I've been working for the last 30 years. This is what it sits on top of, and this is what we're able to recover. So when we're talking about Mexico or Mesoamerica or Moctezuma, then and now, in part, this is what we're talking about. Mesoamerica, secondly, is a great place to study because it's also the location for one of the other great social transformations in human history. Not only the rise of the first cities, but this is where colonialism really gets worked out, what we call colonialism and colonial studies. I mean, colonialism takes place a lot of places, but if you want the data, uh, you want to see uh, the stories, you want to see race mixture, you want to know uh, what happened to languages, you could do a lot worse than studying Mesoamerica in Mexico, uh, where you have not only the moment of the European male coming and grabbing the indigenous female and at the same time murdering the indigenous male, um, you also have people like Frida Kahlo today, uh, or recently, herself embracing her own indigenous tradition in her clothes, in her paintings, and so forth. You also have the analysis of uh, the transformation of these Catholic churches that come from Europe, that come from Spain, that come from Italy, but when they get to the Americas, when they get to Mesoamerica, what happens is the architecture of those buildings change. And they change because indigenous people don't want to go inside those churches. They'll go worship at the churches, but they'll worship outside the churches because they don't trust we're going inside. So what they do is they develop an architecture that the church changes itself so that they can still do the mass, they can still uh, do the preaching, but it takes place in this new atrium, this new kind of outside uh, world. And of course, the Virgin of Guadalupe is so fundamental to all this. 
The other part of the course, the other theme, which I'm going to show you a little bit more about, is that for Latinos today, right here in Chicago, right here on this campus, I'm absolutely sure of it, down at the hotel we're staying, I've already run into them. Uh, these are people who identify in some way, whether you think it's authentic or not, with this indigenous pre-Columbian world, um, and in the politics and the cultural politics of today, all over this country, all over this city, I can show you downtown in Pilsen in some of the murals, they are absolutely drawing upon the work I've been doing at the Templo Mayor in the last 30 years, and their own iconography, their own tattoos, their paintings bring this back. So here you have something I'll show you about in a minute. Here's this, this discovery of the great Koyoshauki stone. And you can see the size of it here. This is a dismembered body of a goddess. And uh, she was discovered under the street behind that cathedral about 30 years ago. Uh, and here you can, you can see uh, this uh, dramatic mythology in stone um, where she has just lost a battle against her brother, the sun. She's the moon. And she's been dismembered into all these parts. Uh, all these parts. And what you have is today Latina artists yeah, doing the same imagery. Here is a, a campesina. Here's a migrant worker a woman on her way in the moon, in the, in the morning, as the moon itself is setting. And the moon is this indigenous goddess who they're identifying with a lot of Mexican Latinos. They identify with this goddess today in some way. And you can see her going to work in the morning with a shovel and a hoe on the one hand and a rifle on the other, representing this kind of feminist critique of the patriarchy. So this is the way this ancient mythology itself is being reworked. So the course, Moctezuma's Mexico, we really have four ways of deciphering that phrase, Moctezuma's Mexico. First part of the course is really about the social history, the sacrificial practices, and the cosmovision of Central Mesoamerica's last political kingdom. That's what most people think of when they hear Moctezuma's Mexico. You must be talking about the Aztecs. So we do have a section in the course on the Aztecs. That's the first section. But the students don't know that there were actually two Moctezumas. There were two rulers named Moctezuma. As a matter of fact, in the whole history of the Aztec lineage, all of the rulers are from the same family. It sounds familiar. They're all from the same family. I don't know if Jeb Bush is going to come back or not. I hope not. But <laughs> those families. They, they, they. So here's the first Moctezuma as he's presented in a European painting in the 18th century, um, this rulership. Here's the second Moctezuma. I like this because my mother painted this in El Paso, Texas. This is her conception of the second Moctezuma, the Moctezuma uh, who uh, meets Cortez and so forth. But what we're trying to do in this part of the course is to really give the students a sense of this urban revolution that takes place in Mesoamerica, starting about 1500 BC, uh, that the Aztec is the culmination of, um, uh, and the role of rulers as well as these powerful sacred spaces Many students want to come and hear about sacrifice. That's one of the draws. Let's face it. Everybody comes and says, oh, oh. But you can show 10-year-olds these skulls, and they'll go, oh, show me more, uh, is what they want to do. You know. Here you see, this is, these are things that came out of the excavation that I've been working on <clears throat> since 1978 in Mexico. Not only faces like this, so it's like he saw something or she saw something but also a human skull that was actually used, in this case, ritually, as a mask. So the person was sacrificed, the skull itself is then was cut in part, and it was used as a mask to hang. Uh, and here you have the notion of sacrifice itself shown uh, in uh, an example of this flint knife uh, in the nose. So when we talk about the Aztec world in the first part of the course, Moctezuma's Mexico, this is what we mean. This is where the great temple stood. This is where the excavation has been taking place, and it's still going on. I was just down there last month with a film crew. Uh, here you can see it. Now, you know, I look at this, and of course, I, I think about my training at the University of Chicago in this school, because one of the things we did talk about was the symbolism of the center. Uh, you may want to push it aside, but the evidence is too strong. Here's the cathedral, right, built right on top uh, of this. In other words, since 1400, this part of Mexico City has been the symbolic center of this country through all of its revolutions and colonialism. There's something about this place uh, that is still uh, very magnetic uh, to, uh, to people. And one of the things that is so outstanding about this central temple that itself was an imitation of a sacred mountain 
is that when the excavation took place, and here we're still in the first part of Moctezuma's Mexico, what they find is that the Aztecs built 125, put 125, now 140 caches of treasures in the floor of the temple that other people never saw because the gods were seeing them because the gods live inside of the temple. And here you see a chamber in which masks were bought from different parts of the empire. You know, uh, these are trumpets. These are actually musical instruments are brought from the ocean. Uh, you have these kinds of urns filled with 6,000 jade beads and so forth uh, in this place. So, so the course does combine not only the history of religions, but this kind of archaeology. But the Aztecs are not just these people cut out people's hearts. You also have these little miniature pieces of alabaster showing a dart, a deer, the flowing of water. But we definitely deal with the notion of sacrifice uh, and so forth. We introduce the whole question of warfare and the spoils of war. Um, and uh, we also look at popular culture. You know, if, um, if I was somebody else, I'd really hate to be conquered by me. Um, and there's a lot of this in popular culture uh, about Moctezuma's Mexico. The second part of the course is we want to bring those students uh, out of this fascination with the Aztec world to see it as an end product of a long history of urban evolution. Uh, and this is where uh, my buddy William Fash really comes in um, because uh, uh, we really start to focus on selected major Maya and Toltec urban centers. I mean, think about it. Think about Wheatley's position here at the University of Chicago when he publishes this book called The Pivot of the Four Quarters, a preliminary inquiry into the origins and nature of the ancient Chinese city. And what he does in this book, and you ought to go check it out, what he does in this book is he chooses those seven areas where primary urban generation took place. Northern China, Mesopotamia, uh, the Indus Valley, Egypt, southwestern Nigeria is a debated case, the highlands of Peru and central Mexico. And he lays out what he thinks had to happen for this revolution in social organization and social stratification uh, to take place. Uh, and so when you could look at the Aztecs, that's cool, but the Aztecs don't come into being until 1325. That's 3,000 years after the urban process has begun in Mesoamerica. And so again, as a Mexican-American historian of religions, I want my students to get a sense of the time depth and the long complexity of this world um, so that they can not only know it for its own interest, but be able then to compare it if they want to be a comparatist in other areas. Now, we use this word Mesoamerica. Where does it come from? It was actually invented in 1943 by this man, a German scholar named Paul Kirchhoff. And Paul Kirchhoff writes an essay that year <coughs> in which he says, look, something changed in human history in the Americas in this area. A new type of social organization began to take place in selected locations, and it spread out uh, during uh, you know, the life of this, uh, th this kind of cultural development uh, to include social stratified, monumental architectural, complex cosmovisions, long and short distance trading traditions and so forth uh, in this area. And this becomes the area of inquiry that begins to take place with some intensity both in Mexico uh, in the United States. Bill Fash gets up and says, look, in terms of political religious organization, what do these two Mexican heroes have in common? You know, and so here you have, look at this character here. This is, this, this deity with his sort of bent nose, looks like he'd been hit by Mike Tyson or something. Um, uh, he's a figure from a great mythology, mythological tradition that comes out of Teotihuacan. How many of you have been to Teotihuacan? Any of you been to the pyramids in Mexico? Hmm. Okay. Um, you gotta go, we gotta take you, we gotta take the seminar down there. So you can see it. <laughs> so here he is. So, so he's the deity who brings about the fifth age of the universe by sacrificing himself, by throwing him into a fire, himself into a fire out of which the sun rises. Right? Um, and this is Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez is the, the hero of the Mexican Republic. If you went to Mexico just last month on March 21st, on Benito Juarez Day, you would have seen 50,000 50, Mexicans going to the place where that God threw himself into the fire. Here's the, the Pyramid of the Sun. And everybody wears white on that day. Uh, it's not organized by any particular organization. They just go there. Um, and they climb the pyramid with the idea that they're reflecting the sun. You see, on Benito Juarez Day, on the, on the President's Day, 
in Mexico, they're remembering this ancient God who brought the sun into being. Uh, and that's what I mean by Mexico, Mesoamerica, Moctezuma's Mexico then and now. There's this really interesting uh, kind of continuity and change. Bill Fash is really an expert on this place of Copan. You must know his work. Um, and we have a section on the great classic Maya um, and the way the classic Maya in this landscape, check it out, in this landscape build an urban civilization. They build the urban world <coughs> that we so much admire and are so much influenced in our studies out here in this location. That's an amazing kind of achievement and it's here that they built what uh, scholars used to call the Athens of the New World, the city of Copan, where Fash and others uh, work uh, and we begin to look at the whole environmental transformations, the way these people use water systems um, uh, to reshape uh, the land so that they could build their cities in this way. Uh, and uh, Fash himself uh, usually takes over this part of the course where you have this uh, combination of scribes, warriors, and kings. Now, one of the things that becomes interesting at this point of the course is to look at the diversity within Mesoamerica, within Moctezuma's Mexico. No, I mean, you know, we're calling this Moctezuma's Mexico. Moctezuma didn't know everything about the Copan. Uh, by Moctezuma's Mexico in this section of the course, we're no longer talking about the Aztecs. We're talking about the urban civilizations that led up to the Aztec world. But one of the things that takes place is that in the Aztec case, what you have is an empire made of a triple alliance. In the Maya world, you don't have empires. You have these uh, very different type of of urban centers organizing among themselves, competing among themselves, sometimes allying among themselves, but they don't build empires. And it's very interesting that when the Spaniards came, it took them a much longer time to subdue the descendants of these cultures than it did to subdue the Aztec world, which had itself concentrated uh, in the Aztec mundi of the capital. Uh, and Fash begins to talk about uh, different kinds of empire building in the course. I'm just gonna run through this. Uh, because uh, one of the things that, that has come up in our own analysis of both the Maya world and the Aztec world, the Toltec world, the contemporary indigenous world, is this fundamental idea that seems to be shared over millennia uh, and cultures, and that's a, a certain type of dualism. <coughs> a, certain, a, comp a dualism of opposing forces in complementary opposition. You see them here at the moment of the creation of the world. You see it here in terms of these two great pyramids of the moon and the sun. Um, you see it here in terms of this image of life and death. Uh, you see it in this constant reference to sun and moon gods and goddesses. And so one of the things we talk about uh, is uh, this notion of dualism. And certainly this idea of the blood debt to the gods. What human sacrifice uh, is really all about. Ancestor worship. Thirdly, because I want to give us some time for discussion. This idea, uh, the third way in which we talk about Mezo, Moctezuma's Mexico is in terms of the gendered, sexual, racial, and religious nature of the Encuentro, the great encounter between European and Mesoamerican societies. And here you see one of an endless number of paintings of this Encuentro, of this cultural encounter where people, where the Europeans show up and they show up in Mexico City meeting Moctezuma, who's speaking his language. He's speaking his language. And here's this crucial woman in between, the bridge called My Back. This is, this is Malinche. This is the indigenous woman who's now trilingual. She speaks, she speaks Spanish. She speaks Nahuatl. She speaks a, a Maya language. And she's the key to the descriptions and the interpretations that take place. So we're talking about this encuentro. And one of the things we want to look at is the women who were at the center of this encuentro, who often were still debased by this encuentro, but showed a certain type of dexterity uh, in this encuentro. And I bring up Iliadi here. I say, look, Iliadi wrote an essay once where he said there were three revolutions in European knowledge. One was the telescope, which revolutionized knowledge of the universe. One was the microscope, which revolutionized knowledge of the inner world. But the third for Iliadi was voyages of discovery, which revolutionized European knowledge terms of human history, culture, and religions, I wrote a book especially for this course <coughs> in order to deal with this whole idea of the encuentro. I went back to Bernal Diaz del Castillo's thousand-page manuscript of his participation 
in Cortez's conquest of Mexico City because he was a, he was a foot soldier and later in life he write, writes his great memoir. I went back and did an annotation of this with a whole series of essays just for the students in this course contextualizing his book and also talking about the role of women uh, in the conquest as reflected not only in his work but in later critics of his work and we put that book, that Spanish version of the conquest, next to this one here, which is called The Broken Spears, written by a Mexican scholar named Leon Portilla. And what he did is he went through all the surviving documents about the conquest and cut out those sections which he felt are the closest to the Aztec view of this exchange. So you look at the Spanish view of this encuentro and you put it up against the Aztec view of the encuentro to see what students will make of some of the same, obje some of the same events described by uh, indigenous people and by Spaniards themselves. Francisco Lopez de Gomara ranked the European discovery of the Americas as one of the three most important events in human history. <coughs> Some of you here are theologians, I know. The creation by God of the universe, the life of Jesus Christ, and the discovery of the new world. And he said, you know, what's happening in Mexico and Mesoamerica for Europe right now? This is the third stage uh, in the most important uh, events uh, in human history. But this was a, a violent clash, as you see in Mexican artists. This is Moctezuma's Mexico then and now. Uh, this is one of the great paintings by Camarena in Mexico City, where you see the eagle warrior himself uh, you know, in the death fight with one of the Spaniards on top of this horse uh, in uh, the Aztec capital. Uh, this is a, a period of great violence. Uh, here's an image, a painting, uh, it's very popular in Mexico today called Alvarado's Leap. Alvarado was one of the great Spanish uh, uh, war conquistadors. And what happens at one point is that the Aztecs get, they get sick of these Spaniards in the city and they drive them out. And this is the moment of driving the Spaniards out of the city after the Spaniards have massacred hundreds of Aztec dancers um, in, a, in a ritual ceremony where they were completely undefended. And if you go to Mexico today, this massacre is still on people's minds. Um, absolutely, you can hear about this anywhere in Mexico uh, today, how important this massacre was. But in the middle is this woman. And in this section of the class, we really raise the issue of the role of indigenous women. Uh, and here you see her in the middle. This is the great Malinche, Doña Marina, herself grew up as, a, <coughs> as an Aztec girl, uh, is given uh, to a Maya family as a child, becomes bilingual and helps Cortez uh, 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 to communicate and eventually conquer the indigenous people, a uh, very important figure today among feminists. What comes out of this, and what's really important as we get down to the students in the class, and even your presentations of your languages, is how important not just race is, but race mixture is in Mesoamerica. In my own debates with Cornel West and my, my African American brothers, you know, talking about race. Yeah, let's talk about race. But let's talk about race mixture, because race mixture is as much the story as this race, racial game between blacks and whites, which is important. I grew up with it. I know about it. I grew up in segregation. But I also grew up on the Mexican border, and I know what racial mixtures have been going on. And if you want to know about the Americas, and if you want to know about the future of the Americas, you better get down on race mixture. And that's one of the reasons that Mesoamerica and Moctezuma's Mexico is a very important part. This is one of the cast paintings which were developed in Peru and Mexico about race mixture. And here you see a very white European Spaniard. I mean, he's super white. My man is super white. Uh, so, 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 so super white guy marries uh, a very kind of prettied up indigenous upper class woman, indigenous, and creates the Mexicans of today, the mestizos, the race, race mixture, who's being carried by a little Indian girl. So you've got the Indian girl who's the servant taking care of the mestizo, who's the mixed race person from this upper class uh, indigenous woman uh, and my man who's super white. Uh, but what happens in Mexico, don't realize it, that there were thousands and hundreds of thousands of Africans who came there. And in the cast paintings about Moctezuma's Mexico as an encounter, what do you have? You have also African women, uh, Spaniards creating mulatos. And these paintings have an elaborate history of what uh, presentation of this type of encuentro, this type of encounter that I think is so important for students uh, to know about. You also have all of these kinds of religious. Finally, because I want to get through this and hear from you. It's about the ways citizens and immigrants of Mexico 
in the U.S. remember and utilize Aztec and Maya myths, rites, and aesthetics in the contemporary political and religious processes of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. I don't know how this is in your studies, but it's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal in the United States now, the way that Latinos, and take a look at my man's tattoo on his back, what's got his back? Well, this is a very famous Aztec sculpture that you'll see these types of tattoos all over the Southwest. Um, and also this uh, Mexican-American painter uh, is painting this uh, indigenous woman down there in the Oaxacan landscape, and who's on her back? On her back is the Virgin of Guadalupe, a Spanish Virgin Mary who becomes indigenized in Mexico, who's absolutely big time. I mean, you, you can't go to a Mexican home in this city and not see this image. You can't go to a Mexican restaurant probably in this city and not see this image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. She, she migrates. Frida Kahlo set this in motion in Mexico. I think some of you know about Frida Kahlo. Well, here's her self-portrait. Here's Frida Kahlo being nursed by her indigenous nanny who is wearing a pre-Columbian Molmec mask. And you can see what she is saying is I as a Mexican am nurtured from the earth of this faceless, unidentified Mexican uh, indigenous person. This to me is Moctezuma's Mexico then and now. Then you have people like this, Esther Hernandez, who's showing the Statue of Liberty being carved into a Maya stile. <coughs> Check it out. Here's the, here's, the, here's the feminist Latina. What is she doing? She's taking the Statue of Liberty and turning it into a stile from Copan and saying, this is liberty. Now, why are they saying this is liberty? They're saying because these people feel that they have been told that the American story that people like Samuel Huntington and other people push has no place for them except as peripheral, basura, extraneous, extra people. And they're saying, we're not taking that anymore. We're going to find ourselves a lineage and a story. And our story is not going to begin in puritanical, puritan, northern European stuff. Why? We tried. And you wouldn't let us in. So we're going to say, we're going to do this kind of thing. That's what's happening in Moctezuma's Mexico today. Then you have cool science fiction original <laughs> movies. It says, it says, the Aztecs summoned the Tyrant Sorners Rex to keep Cortez and the army out of Mexico. Now they need the conquistadors' help to stop the T-Rex from killing them all. <laughs> Here he is. Uh, this is a mural in El Paso of my father's life. Uh, my father passed away about 20 years ago. Uh, they decided to make a mural, part of this mural tradition that comes from Diego Rivera. Uh, what they've done is they've placed my father just exactly in this tradition I'm telling you about. Not only the sort of the science of today, but there's Quetzalcoatl, uh, there's uh, some of the, the, the Maya cities, the landscape itself trying to say this man who comes out of northern Mexico really didn't have much to do with the Aztecs, but he comes out of a tradition of some sort of indigeneity as well as all of this encounter. And that we have to say this is a part of our story because uh, we've been left out of all, the, pushed out of all these other stories. Finally, you've got this whole question of the skeleton. This is one of the walls that we found at the Great Aztec Temple in Mexico City. Of all of these skeletons, this is a little temple and it's all got these different skeletons, not actual skeletons, carved skeletons so what you have is Mexican-American artists, like Octavio Campo has this image of Cesar Chavez. Check him out. Here's Cesar Chavez, who was just trashed in the New Yorker last week by some punk journalist who tried to take Cesar Chavez and make him out to be a paranoid, kind of crazy guy who had all these personal problems. Not a complex person, but they really tried to trash him. You can, you can read it. I like the New Yorker, but I also know the New Yorker has a problem with Latin Americans and it has a problem with Latinos in this country. And this essay, trashing this guy, check it out. So what do you have here? You have this painter by Octavio Campo, this painting. And here's Cesar Chavez, who had led the farm workers movement. And if you look at it closely, it's not really him. Everything, he's made up of all of these people. And over here on this side are all these skulls out here in the fields. You see, these are skulls. This is what happens to farm workers. And they're buried up here. These are the burials of the farm workers. He's taken this Aztec notion of the skulls. And what does he do with it? He shows you that the skulls are not skulls. They're actually families. These are two sisters. This is a mother hey, hugging these two children. You know, here's somebody carrying a wounded person. 
So he's taking this whole idea of the Aztec skull and sacrifice, and he's saying, for these Mexican Americans, this tradition becomes a kind of victimization by this whole agricultural industry. The biggest event now at Harvard in the museums is built around this particular image. This is a Day of the Dead altar that I curated eight years ago when I first came to Harvard. They asked me to help them put up a Day of the Dead altar. <clears throat> I'm not sure why, but every year on the Day of the Dead, the biggest public event at Harvard University takes place at this particular altar where 600 people from the community, most of them not Latinos, come and they have this wild night in the museum. As a result of that, I'm kind of a local hero in the museum <laughs> uh, because they, were, they, they didn't think this was going to happen. Uh, that uh, having this Moctezuma's Mexico then and now, uh, and then finally, check this out. Yeah, I am on Day of the Dead, giving a talk. And the students have come. This is, the, this is a group of students, Latino students. They call themselves Mariachi Veritas. <laughs> The Harvard motto is Veritas. Can you believe it? They would call themselves Veritas, the truth. So they call themselves Mariachi Veritas. And Day of the Dead, they come and they perform there. And they ask me to introduce them. But what really, and this is my final thing, what really impressed me was I, in the early days of teaching this at, at Harvard, unbeknownst to me, there were a bunch of students in the class who were drama majors. And that year, they were in charge at the ART of doing the student production. They decided to do Richard III. And they decided to set Richard III in Mexico City at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards. And the whole set was the Aztec Templo Mayor. Here it is. The Templo Mayor was the site of the warring houses of Lancaster and York in William Shakespeare's Richard III. And the whole play, which was a big run for two weeks at Harvard, took place in terms of their reading of Shakespeare down there in Moctezuma's Mexico, in which the humpback Richard becomes this Aztec who had repulsive skin disease. So you know that Richard, he's got this hunchback. Well, here he said, look, what's the disease that the, that the Aztecs had? Well, they had these terrible skin diseases. So this is Richard, <laughs> here's Richard here. Uh, so what they've done is they've taken this Moctezuma's Mexico and they've turned it into this. So that's the course. That's the introductory lecture to the course. Uh, I do have some, now the other thing I want to say, and then I, I'm sorry I've taken so long, is that what really makes the course work at Harvard is the Peabody Museum. Because at Harvard, I don't know if it's at Chicago, you have all these sections where you also meet in small groups. And what we've been able to do, and let me just pass these around really quickly. Uh, what we've been able to do is have each week we have these sections, one for each side. And in these sections, the students get to come and handle these materials, that the music, that all the loot. We've got Aztec masks, we've got Maya jade, we've got stuff that came out of the cenote. Um, and we set up assignments, and the reason that we now have 200 students taking this class is partly these sections, where they get to come and really look at, handle to some degree, to see this material world of Moctezuma's Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
How do you how do you grapple with that and, and engage that? I, I think you have to do it in the small groups. You, know, you give this talk and then you get into small groups and you try to uh, you know, give them as much background about the cosmovision. You know, while people here were talking about cosmogonies and cosmologies in Mexico, they dealt with this category of cosmovision. And this has really become a very useful notion to compare cosmovision. So one of the things that I do is I, I obviously compare it to Catholic Mass. And I talk about crucifixions. Uh, and I don't try to defend it and say, well, these are good people. This is just their, their theology. You talk about what their theology was uh, and how they rationalized this. Uh, and we also try to do some sense of their anthropology. These people have the notion of three souls. One was in the head, one was in the heart, and one was in the liver. And there's a lot of literature about this, these animistic entities. Um, and the fact that that's what they sacrifice, they're trying to get those animistic entities out of these people into their community. And, um, you know, if at the end they don't like him, but I don't like him either, some of that stuff. So, but you're right, at the end you'll get people saying exactly that. So I think you have to do it in terms of what's called guided group interactions. So, so thank you for that question. Who else? I'd like to get some feedback. Well, I think that you know, I've talked, I've team talked with, with him, with Arthur Kleinman, and other anthropologists, uh, Michael Jackson, and uh, essentially anthropologists, and the other ones, and the other linguists. Each one is a different reason. The key I found is in preparation. You really got to have a lot of preparation. Uh, and, and, and not only preparing for the materials, but being honest about the different approaches. And you know, is there going to be a, you know, a head person? Uh, and that always comes into play. Um, and, um, and with Bill Fash, it's been very it's been very easy because uh, he, he's not a, a nationalist Mayanist. Uh, he really is interested in the larger Mesoamerican world, but he, he knows the, the great Mayan contributions. Um, uh, I think that the other thing that I have found crucial in all of these courses, especially the team talk courses, is the training of the TFs. The TFs are really pushed to the heart. Uh, and I've been really lucky to have some, some great TS, but they've got to be trained. Um, and TS or TAs? Yeah, TS. They won't teach you about the TAs. TS. That's really, really crucial. Um, so with Arthur Kleinman, who's a, you know, a major figure, we not only met, but we actually had a workshop, a weekend workshop, with some other people on campus about the course to really you know, open up limitations and biases and what would work. So I think team teaching, I, mean, I think there's too much to learn, uh, uh, But I benefit from it because it lightens my load and I, I learn from people. But I think you've got to really to make it work so it's not just you know, the way that you cut your work in half. You've got to spend a lot of time in preparation. Uh, that, that I think is the Yes. I have a question about, um, I was really interested in what you were saying earlier about your, your class in Colorado when you had um, sort of uh, local native people come to the class and kind of you said, end up on your side. Um, and I was wondering about uh, sort of the, the personal side of that as, as sort of someone who comes in with pedagogy because, you know, I, I, I don't know if for you that was just a result of the way you presented the material or if you had to sort of engage in the level of your own personal history or something like that. And I can see where that might go wrong, but also if, say, you're teaching something about a group of which you are not part of, um, if you have ideas about how to sort of dispel uh, the kind of things that we're sort of talking about. Well, you know, I think in any situation, there was always a testing. People came and they tested me out. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened to me that was beneficial, when I first got to the University of Colorado, my first job, there were several students in anthropology who were trying to write dissertations about their field work. And in both cases, in these two cases, both of them had been adopted in some way by indigenous people. One, a medicine man, one of them, uh, Crow, another, uh, Danny Robert Carlson, uh, among the contemporary Tutsu de Maya. And they were having trouble in the anthropology department writing about, figuring a way to write about the sacred things of others without the meaning. Um, because the anthropologists were going to anthropologists, but 
they, you know, they, they were not so accepting of, this, of the sacrality of these things. And, and I was, and they heard, came and heard me lecture, and they said, hey, you can talk to this guy. This guy respects the people we're talking about in a way that's almost like an insider. Not well done. And so as a result of that, I was invited to the Department of Anthropology to be on these PhDs. Both of them were very successful in their dissertation, and they went on their careers because they figured out how to, how to walk this line. So in that case, I had kind of mediators who first cued me into that. Um, and at some point, I had to relinquish the American Indian religions class because as the Native American scholars and voices became more powerful, they wanted to do it themselves. So I'm down with that. That's cool. I can move on. You know, so that's another thing you have to do. I mean, when the time gets to that, when they say, hey, we want Native Americans to teach it. Well, I don't believe that's necessary, but I'll go along. You, know, you don't have to be Native American to teach Native American stuff. You don't need to be Latino to teach Latino stuff. But if the political situation is that, the cats want to take it over, go ahead. And they'll be calling me back in two years. Hey, man, give us a hand. <laughs> Yes? Um, I'm just curious, that, not just in this course, but in others as well, how you balance um, students reading theory and, and reading um, sort of these, what theory would look at as case studies, yeah. um, and how you know how you keep the course balanced in a way that you want them to understand it without thinking, oh, so that's the way you interpret it because I read that theory. That's a really good question. I think in this case, you know, the, the, the reason in the American Indian Religions class, and the reason I did the Bernal Diaz book, was that I think it's, it's good to start with a complex voice that appears to be indigenous. But all of these indigenous voices, by the way, not all of them, many of them by the time they get into print, they, they've been, there's been a mixture. You may have heard them in Chew, wrote this book, supposedly wrote this book about her life, and it ends up that there was a lot of preparation that, in fact, the book itself is a, is, is a book of contention and encounter. Same with Blackout. Don't you, so you talk with Blackout, and it looks like, hey, man, Blackout's given us his, his story. But then you, you realize that, and, and the students benefit by it, that in fact, there's been all kinds of dialogue, with, in this case, John Neihardt. Uh, and it's not just Blackout's voice, it's a mixed voice. Uh, and, and that mixed voice has its own kind of, of problem and presentation. I mean, you can take a look at Blackout Speaks, or you can take a look at Bernard Diaz of Castillo. These are really valuable accounts, but they're, they're also very complex, and they have kind of theory in them. That's the other thing. They have a theory in them, and that theory of cosmology, that theory of the encounter, you want to put alongside, uh, you know, of Orientalism, uh, or uh, Franz Fanon, and so forth. And put them all, try to put them alongside, even though the students some students will like it and put them on side. There's an equal basis on that. This one has a little upper hand. Uh, but it's, it's a good dialogue. And I think that's, if you, I think starting a course with some good case studies is really important. It's been in my, my, in my case, it's been really important. And I notice that the students relax. You give them something like broken spears, this, this, these cuttings that really are the closest you're going to get to an Aztec voice. They kind of relax about that. I don't like that, and I think that's, that's the way I've done it. I'd be interested in how others. Thank you for that question. Well, this conversation could go on a lot longer, and it will uh, resume at 4.30 uh, with uh, Professor Carrasco's uh, lecture. about the material and how you think inside your know, work as an educator, um, introducing the complex layers of Moctezuma's um, magic then and now. And it was great to, to go on the, the journey of the course. So next year, I think there'll be 35 more people registered in your 300 <laughs> class <laughs> at, at Harvard. And, uh, and then we want you to take us to, to, to Mexico. <laughs> so, so we're looking forward to that. Um, but please join me in thank you. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.